Welcome to Brain Fluence. I'm Roger Dooley. Joining me today is Dr. Gad Sad. He's professor of marketing at the John Molson School of Business at Concordia University, where he held the research chair in evolutionary behavioral sciences and Darwinian consumption from 2008 to 2018. He's a pioneer in the application of evolutionary psychology to consumer behavior, a topic of interest to many of us here, and is the author of The Evolutionary Basis of the Consumption and the Consuming Instinct. He writes online in Psychology Today, and his new book is The Parasitic Mind, How Infectious Ideas Are Killing Common Sense. Welcome to the show, Gad. So good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Again, most of our listeners probably have some idea of what evolutionary psychology is uh, uh, or evolutionary behavioral science. Can you briefly uh, uh, explain what that topic is about and why it's important? Sure. So evolutionary psychology is basically the application of evolutionary biology and evolutionary reasoning to the study of the human mind. So we can use evolutionary theory to study why our kidneys are formed the way that they are or why we have opposable thumbs. But I think for most social scientists, it is difficult for them to accept that the most important organ in our body, which is our brain, is also under the influence of evolution. Many, many social scientists think that evolution stops at the neck. So sure, you can use uh, evolutionary theory to explain why uh, my femur is the way that it is or my pancreas are the way, but don't you dare say that evolution has anything to do with the human mind. And so what I did in, in founding the field of evolutionary consumption is I took evolutionary biology and I said, we can't study consumer behavior without understanding the biological roots of what makes us be the consumers that we are. And I define, by the way, consumption very broadly. It's not just consuming Coca-Cola and Starbucks, but we also consume friendships, we consume religious narratives, we consume experiences, we consume uh, mate choice as a consumatory choice. And so I really put pretty much everything that's purposive under the umbrella of consumption. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How widely accepted are these ideas in the field of psychology? I know uh, I've cited the work of uh, Jeffrey Miller in the past. Uh, I'm sure you're you're well familiar with. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, it's it's funny it, in this group of psychologists, it seems uh, to be very well accepted, but uh, you don't hear that much about it uh, in the sort of a broader sweep of people uh, writing uh, psychology-based papers or uh, behavioral science papers. Yeah. So. Uh... In answering your second question, I'll go back to your first question where you asked evolutionary psychology and evolutionary behavioral sciences. Well, evolutionary behavioral sciences is actually a broader rubric, if you'd like. Evolutionary okay. psychology is one evolutionary-based disciplines amongst the evolutionary behavioral sciences. So you, ethology is something that uh, uh, Conrad Lawrence and two of his colleagues won the Nobel Prize for back in the early 70s. In that case, that was also within evolutionary behavioral sciences. In their case, they were studying the evolutionary roots of instincts. So for example, when a chicken or, or any bird hatches, the first animal that it sees moving, it associates as it being the parent, and that is known as imprinting. So we could take mm -hmm. away the, the mama chicken and put a Doberman pincher and then the chick will think that the Doberman Pinscher is the mom. So that would be one evolutionary based field that preceded evolutionary psychology. Uh, behavioral ecology is another field within the evolutionary behavioral sciences where you are trying to study how cross-cultural differences could be due to evolutionary based thinking. So for example, the fact that in some cultures we have more spices that we use in the cuisines, right? India has spicier foods than Sweden. That itself could be due to an evolutionary-based logic. Uh, there is Darwinian anthropology, which is also within the evolutionary behavioral sciences. So there's been a long tradition of evolutionary-based fields leading to evolutionary psychology. So to answer now your second question, which is how accepted is it? It is increasingly accepted, but it remains uh, quite controversial but only because there is a large frequency of imbeciles. There is no reason why anything in evolutionary psychology should be controversial. There is no other alternative than the human mind has evolved through the exact same forces that have led to the evolution of every single other living organism on earth, right? But 
because people are ideologically motivated, there is a very long queue of people who hate evolutionary psychology for all the wrong reasons. I suspect that if you and I held this chat in 50 years, there would be many fewer detractors because the beauty of science is that it is autocorrective. That which is controversial to today, tomorrow become normal science as Thomas Kuhn said. Mm -hmm. uh, how much bad thinking is there in social sciences uh, in general? I mean, uh, you know, we've gone through the replication crisis where that sort of cast doubt on uh, many uh, studies in the field and the many leading scientists. Now, we've, I, I think we've kind of gotten past some of that and saying, okay, well, some stuff couldn't replicate because it was just bad science and other stuff uh, didn't replicate because it was specific to a particular experimental condition. And when somebody tried to replicate it, they couldn't do it. Uh, and really what that does is that just understands, it helps us understand that particular phenomenon. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the first group was doing bad science. It just means that we're establishing some boundary conditions for that science. Uh, but I mean, how would you characterize the field as a whole, Gad? So it, it really depends. In some cases, there are whole disciplines within the social sciences and, and the humanities that are complete quackery. And in a sense, many of the idea pathogens that I described in the parasitic mind are precisely manifestations of that kind of stupidity, postmodernism and critical race theory and identity politics and cultural relativism and biophobia, the fear of biology. All of these things have found their way within the social sciences and they are dreadful ideas because they're actually anti-scientific. But even if, so if we exclude those for a second, uh, you're exactly correct that the social sciences, even when they are pursuing assiduously the scientific method, will oftentimes fail, for example, the replication crisis, because oftentimes in the social sciences, as I explained in some of my previous books, we don't have an organizing framework that can result in what the natural sciences have, which is a, ter a term that was reintroduced into the lexicon by E.O. Wilson in the late 1990s. He wrote a book called Consilience. Consilience mm -hmm. refers to unity of knowledge, right? So physics- yeah, that, that was a tough read. For that me, at was least. a great book, right? And it was very influential in my own thinking because as I was trying to develop an uh, evolutionary consumer psychology, as I was trying to Darwinize the business school, uh, I relied on the fact that the ultimate goal of that you know, initiative is to create greater consilience. What happens in the social sciences is people come from completely different original starting points, which then results in bifurcations in the tree of knowledge, not allowing us to have a consilient tree of knowledge. And so I think the main problem with the social sciences is not that they are epistemologically any less scientific than the natural sciences. It's not as though a sociologist can't be as serious and as rigorous a scientist as a physicist, but a chemist, there are no chemists who believe in the periodic table and chemists who don't believe in the periodic table. They've resolved that problem. Whereas in the social sciences, we can't even agree whether the human mind is based on, is shaped by evolution or not. And so you could imagine how all kinds of bifurcations in our knowledge can arise. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. You know, um, one of the things I, when I got your book, I had to dig into my own library and I found a book from, I think it was 1996, Virus of the Mind by Richard Brody. And, um, uh, you know, I guess this thought, in fact, the subtitle has the word meme in it. And of course, today, nobody then knew what a meme was outside of a few very specific folks. Now everybody knows what a meme is, although it's not exactly the same definition today uh, as in, you know, nothing to do with uh, uh, cat videos or pictures of Trump or whatever. Um, so um, I'm curious, this, this has been evolving. Sorry about that. I made a bad choice of words. Uh, tell me how your thinking has evolved over the years, Gad. Yeah, so, uh, so to, to specifically talk about you know, mimetic theory and so on, uh, mimetic theory is actually one of those fields that is subsumed within the evolutionary behavioral sciences. I discussed this in my first book, The Evolutionary Basis of Consumption. So as, you, as some of your listeners and viewers may know, the, the concept of a meme was really popularized by Richard Dawkins in 1976, so now more than 40 years ago, in his book, The Selfish Gene, where he argued that the analog to a gene 
So genes can propagate, but we are also cultural animals. We're not only biological animals. So what is the, the, the mechanism of propagation when we are trying to spread beliefs or ideas or jingles? Well, he took the term meme as the cultural analog to the gene. And mm -hmm. so then that spawned a, you know, several you know, decades of work on mimetic theory. And frankly, it's been quite a disappointing. Uh, Susan Blackmore was someone who, who wrote about memes. She was a mimeticist. Uh, this book that you referred to also talks about memes. Uh, Daniel Dennett, the very famous uh, philosopher, talked about, uh, for example, religion being viruses of the human mind, right? And the amemaplex. Amemaplex is a collection of memes put together into a coherent, some say coherent, others would say not coherent if you're talking about religion, but putting them together in a in a in a uh, organized framework. Uh, so in the same way that you have a cineplex, a cineplex is a collection of cinemas, movie theaters. Well, a memeplex is a collection of memes. So Islam is a memeplex, Judaism is a memeplex, and then it gets spread through different brains. And now, if you think that that's a bad idea to spread, it becomes a virus, right? Now, in my case, I'm, I'm creating a bit, well, not a bit, I'm, I'm, I'm saying something quite different. Yes, these ideas are spreading from brain to brain, but I'm calling them parasitic. So I'm, I'm coming from a, and that's why I call them idea pathogens, because a meme could be positive, it could be neutral, it could be negative. If I start singing a jingle and you overhear it, you, then I might infect your brain with my jingle, and you, but it's harmless, right? Whereas a, a parasitic idea, here I go to the field of neuroparasitology. And so maybe if you, if you give me permission, I can explain what that is because it kind of serves as the background. Sure, go Thank for you. it. So as an evolutionary psychologist, one of the things that we do is we look at other species to then draw comparisons with humans. And this is the field called comparative psychology. So I've always had the reflex to look, for example, if I'm studying toy preferences or, or writing about toy preferences, I will look at studies that have looked at toy preferences in rhesus monkeys and vervet monkeys and chimpanzees to show that they actually exhibit the same type of sex specificity of toy preferences as human infants do. And so because of that uh, ability to look at other animals and draw conclusions with humans, by the way, this is called uh, the study of homologies and analogies when you're comparing across species. As I was thinking about all of these dreadful ideas that I've been seeing in universities for the past 26 plus years that I've been in, as a professor, I started thinking, well, what would be the field for other animals that captures these kinds of parasitic ideas? And of course, I fell on the field of parasitology, which is the study of how parasites can infect a host. But neuroparasitology is a specific subbranch, which is the field of parasitology that looks at when a, a, a parasite seeks to find the host's brain, and then it rewires its behavior to its advantage, but to the detriment of the host. So the classic example would be Toxoplasma gondii, which is a parasite that can if, in, infect the, the brains of mice, causing the mice to lose their innate fear of cats and actually become sexually attracted to the cat's urine, which is not really a good preference for a <laughs> mouse to hold. And so I said, aha, I had found, if you like, my, my framework for how to analogize actual brain worms, actual brain parasites to these dreadful, bad parasitic ideas. And so what I do in the book is I trace where these bad ideas originate from, they all come from the university ecosystem because it takes intellectuals to come up with really dumb ideas. And then I offer towards the end of the book, inoculation, a vaccine, just like we're trying to find a solution to the current COVID crisis by creating a vaccine. Well, can we come up with a set of uh, decision-making rules, epistemological rules that can help us protect ourselves from these dreadful ideas. So that gives you a, a, a big overview of the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, one of the distinctions you make really early on in the book, Ed, is uh, the difference between uh, emotional and rational thinking. Uh, you bring out Kahneman system one and system two. And I 
often use conscious and non-conscious uh, decision making. Uh, as I use that as sort of an overall shorthand, even though obviously there are various uh, maybe subcategories in there. Uh, and I, I was really kind of amused because uh, yesterday I was doing a uh, virtual keynote, haven't done a real one in person in a while, and uh, I talked about fragrance marketers and how uh, you will never see a fragrance marketer uh, doing some kind of comparison study of their product with someone else's fragrance or uh, providing yeah, uh, you know, facts and figures. Book. And uh, yeah, and then I, I'm reading your book and I found the exact same example in there. So that uh, really made me chuckle. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, explain, uh, and it, well, one point you make too is that uh, our problems as humans start to uh, arise when we use the wrong type of thinking for exactly. a particular issue. So explain, explain that uh, paradigm, because you know, obviously we all uh, think emotionally, we think rationally, and you know, certain decisions, obviously if you're uh, you know, uh, buying a piece of technical gear, you probably better have your uh, rational hat on for that one. Uh, <laughs> you wanna buy the one that looks best. Um, but uh, explain uh, how this uh, works and how it changes our behavior. Sure. So. Uh... There's a term that I introduced very early in the chapter, uh, which I, I refer to as epistemological dichotomania, which basically refers to the human pension and certainly within academia to create two systems that you pit against each other. It's nature or nurture. Whereas of course that's a wrong dichotomy because nurture doesn't exist outside of nature. The, the forms that nurture takes is usually because of nature, right? And so, I, I start with that example because I want to provide sort of the, the, the theoretical ground for then saying it is wrong to say there is emotional you know, uh, processing and rational processing. We're either thinking animals or we are feeling animals. Of course, as you correctly said, we are both. The, the, the problem arises when we activate the wrong system at the wrong time. So the an example that I give in the book is where if I'm going down a shortcut and to, to get home and I'm taking an alley and I see four young men loitering and I get an activated fear response, my heart starts racing, uh, I start perspiring, uh, that fear response, which is based on an emotional system, is perfectly adaptive from an evolutionary perspective. It makes sense that at that context, you know, I didn't engage in co cognitive reasoning. But if I'm trying to solve a calculus problem, all of the emotional triggering in the world is not gonna solve the calculus problem. So the problem arises when we apply the wrong system at the wrong time. So then I, the reason why I set all that up is because then I argue that for many purposive and important decisions that we make, like choosing a political candidate for president, we should be activating our cognitive system a lot more than we end up doing and we end up using most of our dis decisions based on the affective system. I hate Trump. He disgusts me. He's repulsive. So all of these things that I just said are all emotional responses. If I were to then challenge you and say, but give me some cognitive justifications for why you hate Trump. Many people, including my highfalutin elitist ivory power dwelling colleagues won't be able to enunciate a cognitive reason. He's disgusting. He's a, he's a ogre. He's vile, right? So he's, it's, he's what I call, he's a visceral aesthetic injury, right? So no, uh, for many, sorry, for many issues, something popped up on my screen. For many issues, uh, you, you need to engage your cognitive system. So one of my very good friends, I won't mention him, but many of your listeners might know him, is an incredibly uh, you know, uh, reasoned intellectual, but who suffers from a dreadful case of Trump derangement syndrome, where literally every single day on his Twitter feed, today is the day that the, the prediction that he is an existential threat is going to come through. And then today passes and it doesn't happen. No, 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 I mean, today it will be the day. And the next day it's today is the day. So you end up being a doomsday prophet. Now, how could it be that such a rational person who is otherwise a very measured intellectual can succumb to such hysteria? Well, that's because it's only driven by his affective system. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And actually, I think I'm seeing a little bit of that too in relation to the COVID messaging that you see in the, the opinions people have about uh, uh, what's going on. It's, it's amazing how many narratives there are uh, that aren't 
aren't based in statistics. Uh, they're just based on some kind of emotional reaction to things. And I've had uh, people who I consider to be, you know, intelligent, uh, logical business people who, you know, clearly could not be in business for years successfully if they were irrational. Uh, they would. <laughs> a business is rather Darwinian, I find, uh, and uh, you, know, you, you can only fake, fake it for so long. Uh, but who have, you know, some of the uh, more strange opinions on this topic uh, that don't necessarily comport with uh, what I, at least what I see is reality uh, from the statistics. So uh, I, I definitely see how that can happen. I think one example you have in the book too uh, uh, involving Trump is the over the top emotional reaction that some people had to his election, which uh, you know, I think it's normal to be disappointed if your candidate does not win a presidential election. Uh, it's probably normal to be concerned if you feel that they will be making some bad decisions uh, that could affect you or affect the country. Uh, but uh, it seemed that this particular election produced uh, a far more emotional reaction than anyone I can remember, where we had people who were, uh, you know, uh, on the floor sobbing. Uh, and uh, that I didn't quite understand. <laughs> You have a Nobel Prize winner, Paul Krugman, say in economics, stating that, that, I mean, that's it. The economy is going to be non-existent. And I'm being a bit facetious here and being hyperbolic to, to paraphrase what he said. But basically, we're going to go back to the Stone Age with bartering because Trump is going to destroy the economy, right? We're going to be using smoke signals and uh, homing pigeons because he's going to destroy the economy. Uh, he's going to bring about a nuclear holocaust. He's going to end democracy. Martial law is going to be instituted. That is such a vulgar, you know, instantiation of supposed reasoning, right? I mean, you, as you said, hate the guy. Think he is grotesque. The sun is going to rise tomorrow. And guess what? Whether Trump is in office for four years or eight years, you'll get through this and life will go on. With, he'll be nothing but a little blip. But it's exactly what we've been talking about. Because in this case, Trump is such a, I mean, Trump basically is a rejection of all of the mechanisms by which the intelligentsia has defined itself. So that's why they can't stand him, right? That's why I say he's an aesthetic injury, right? If someone like him who speaks with the uh, bragging and the obnoxiousness and the narcissism and the grandiosity that he speaks of. If he could become president of the United States, then why did I go and get my women's studies degree at Brown so I could sip with my pinky <laughs> up? It invalidates my personhood. So it's a form of ego defensiveness. If he could make it, it invalidates my existence. He can't have, he can't be, he can't have ascended to this position. So it's really grotesque and, uh, you know, in a sense, maybe it's a bit of a form of schadenfreude because I am in Canada, but I'm kind of hoping that Trump wins again so that I could sit back with a nice cognac and watch the morons and imbeciles go hysteric for another four years. <laughs> right. Well, we'll see, because this will actually, uh, uh, we're recording this about us. Uh, uh, five days or something, four days before the election, it will air, I think, about a week and a half after the day of the election, although who knows if we'll even have a decision by then, uh, with so many states uh, experiencing massive mail order ballots, uh, and some don't even begin opening those envelopes until election day, uh, it will be uh, potentially a crazy day, week, months, I hope not. Uh, uh, but uh, anyway, you know, you talk about idea pathogens, Gad, as liberating people from the shackles of reality. What what do you mean by liberating people from the shackles of yeah, reality? Yeah, thank you for asking this. Uh, so as I was looking at each of those dreadful parasitic ideas, I said, you know, what do they have in common? So, it, it, so if you think about, say, cancer, there are many different forms of cancers. There's pancreatic cancer and testicular cancer and leukemia and so on. But one thing that they have in common is that they are all the unchecked cell division, right? So we can at least say that irrespective of which cancer we're talking about, there is at least the, you know, because my brain, the way it works is it's, it's, it's synthetic, right? It looks for consilience. So what is common across all of these cancers? What, how can we unify the social sciences under an evolutionary framework? And so, he, so this is how I came up with this idea of idea pathogens as freedom from reality. Because I was saying, 
So all of these ideas are dreadful in their own unique way, but what do they have in common? And so that's how I got the insight of, well, it, they all share an equal commitment to freeing the believer in that parasitic idea from the shackles of reality. So what do I mean by that? Take, for example, social constructivism. Social constructivism is the idea that everything is due to a social construction. We are a born empty slate with equal potentiality. And then it's only the vagaries of socialization that result in me becoming Lionel Messi, the famous soccer player, and you becoming the great diplomat and him becoming Pablo Picasso. It's only socialization that led to that. Well, that's a great message. It's a hopeful message because it says, hey, maybe my kid could be the next Michael Jordan. There is no starting point, genetic point, that would make my kid less likely to be Albert Einstein or Michael Jordan. Well, that's very freeing, right? It frees me from the shackles of reality in this thing, in, in this case, something called genetic differences, biological based differences, but it's also pure bullshit, if you forgive the term, right? Uh, Postmodernism frees me from the shackles of universal truths, because what does, what does postmodernism say? There are no objective truths. Everything is shackled by the constraints of our subjectivity, of our personal biases, right? Transgenderism frees me from the biological reality of my genitalia. So each of these idea pathogens is a way for me to free myself from this really pesky thing called reality. Well, it's very liberating, but it's also false, right? Now, I don't mean to, when I say false, I don't mean to imply that transgender people don't really exist. I don't mean to imply that transgender people don't have the right to live with full dignity and free of bigotry. But I do mean that in the pursuit of that laudable goal, we don't murder truth. We don't at the same time say, if you're a six foot seven biological male, 285 pounds, who yesterday was called Joe, but today you come out as self-identifying as woman, now because you are a trans woman, you could compete in sports with biological females. And anybody who disagrees with that must be a transphobic Nazi. So th this is the problem with these parasitic ideas. They all start with a kernel of truth, with a noble goal, but then they end up freeing us from the shackles of reality. Hmm. Yeah, um, to uh, circle back to uh, the business where I'm curious and, and, and uh, evolutionary psychology or perhaps evolutionary behavioral science, uh, I'm curious uh, how many of our cognitive biases, I mean, now if you go to uh, a list of cognitive biases, whether it's confirmation bias or endowment factor, all these things, yeah. uh, you will find uh, dozens or even a hundred plus, depending on oh, how yeah. fi finely you slice them. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, uh, do most of those or any of those have roots uh, in uh, our DNA and evolution? Fantastic question. Fantastic question. And it's actually... Uh, it's the way by which I moved from behavioral decision theory to evolutionary psychology. So my, my training uh, it was very much rooted in the Tversky and Kahneman, the, 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 the cognitive biases paradigm. But then I became very disenchanted with the, what you know, facetiously I would call the violation of the month club paradigm, which is every month, some very clever psychologist would come up with some new experimental design to demonstrate that the axioms of rational choice as postulated by classical economic theory are wrong. And, and, and I'm not denigrating at all Kahneman and Tversky. As a matter of fact, they're, they're good friends of my former doctoral supervisor who himself is a very noted behavioral decision theorist and cognitive psychologist, J. J. Edward Russo. And one of my professors is Dick Thaler, who, who won the Nobel Prize recently. So I'm very well steeped. I know he, he actually uh, is an endorser on my friction book. So I, I was very proud of that. Oh, that's wonderful, congrats. And so, so I'm, I'm very well steeped within that behavioral decision-making paradigm. But what I've always thought was lacking is exactly the question that you posed, which is, okay, so we've spent 40, 40 plus years demonstrating that this mythical species called Homo economicus doesn't exist. But that's kind of silly, right? Because 
we, we know that the model of decision making as postulated by classical economists is just a stylized normative model of decision making. This would be like a physiologist spending 40 years to demonstrate that the pancreas of humans is not like the pancreas of the mythical unicorn. Well, the mythical unicorn doesn't exist. So why are we spending so much time shooting down that mythical unicorn that doesn't exist? A lot more interesting is to ask the question that you said, to the extent that we exhibit these cognitive biases, why would, what would be the evolutionary reason for us to have the, evolved that cognitive architecture? And I'm here to tell you that very few people have tackled that question. W one within that group of cadre that has done that is Gerd Gigerenzer and his colleagues. Are you familiar with Gerd? I'm not, but uh, I will try and get familiar with him. It sounds interesting. Yeah, so Gerd Gigerenzer is a, is a, a German psychologist. Uh, and actually his group had invited me back in 2001 to the Max Planck Institute in, uh, in uh, Germany. Uh, and what they have tried to do is look at many of these cognitive biases via an evolutionary lens. So for example, they developed the idea uh, of fast and frugal heuristics, right? It makes evolutionary sense for us to evolve fast and frugal heuristics. And let me give an example of this in a business context, since many of your listeners are you know, business uh, folks. Uh, if you take, for example, something uh, known as the recognition heuristic, which is a fast and frugal heuristic, it is easily deployed, quickly deployed, and it requires very little cognitive cost. Well, we often choose things simply using the cue of, if I recognize it, I choose it. So let's take in a specific business context. I could show you a bunch of companies and ask you, which ones should I invest in for maximal return? And I could use a very fancy mathematical model with PhDs in physics and mathematics and econometrics, or I could use the following fast and frugal heuristic. Go down the list of all these companies and only invest in the companies that you recognize. I mean, that's a lot less fancy than using Brownian motion to model <laughs> maximal stock return. So Ford, I recognize. Gentech, I don't. Uh, Apple, I recognize. And it ends up that that recognition heuristic does perform very well. Uh, the, if, I, if memory serves me well, the, the gentleman who did the, these research with, with the, within the Gigerenzer group is Daniel Goldstein. And so here's an example where you're looking at how the architecture of our thinking would have evolved to deploy these fast and frugal heuristics. And it makes perfect evolutionary sense for, it to have, for our brain to have evolved that way. And so to answer your question in this very long-winded way, uh, if some of your viewers are interested in this stuff, I see the next frontier as being exactly your question, which is applying an evolutionary lens to understanding these cognitive biases. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll, I'm uh, looking forward to that because uh, to me, it's been a neglected area. You can certainly come up with um, easy mental models of why we behave in a certain way and why that would have made sense in our hunter-gatherer days and it's influencing us now. But uh, I, I haven't seen that much formal research, so that, that should be interesting. Uh, let me ask you about uh, something else kind of along the same lines. Sure. Uh, Conwin said there is a law of least effort for cognitive and physical effort, and people have been talking about law of least effort for years. It's not really an established uh, scientific principle like the law of gravity or something, but um, uh, do you think that uh, uh, that exists? And you know, to me, uh, when uh, Danny Ariely found that word free was really powerful to people, uh, you know, that uh, beyond whatever monetary value. So like uh, if somebody was giving you something for free or for a penny, the, uh, the amount of money may be inconsequential, but uh, the effect on people's behavior is greatly different. You know, I had visions of uh, this sort of low hanging fruit uh, uh, in our days when we were evolving that, hey, even if uh, you don't need something, if, it's, if it's, there's no effort to get it, then you'll probably grab it. Uh, I, I'm curious whether you have any opinions on that. So uh, you're asking me to comment about sort of a law of least cognitive yeah, effort. Yeah, right, yeah, way. right. Because I mean, that's, that's kind of what you're talking about, um, uh, Thaler, it's sort of what right. uh, got him his, his prize was uh, saying, well, if you make things really easy for people, they'll do it right. more. Right, so let me, let me give you a, a, an example of that and answering your question, which then I can relate back to our earlier conversation about Trump. 
So there are many decision rules that we can deploy when making a decision. So the, the classic economic normative model would say that if I'm choosing between say two products, uh, both products are defined by a bunch of attributes. Uh, I will look at all of the attribute values of the two products and I would weigh them by the importance of each attribute in arriving at a final overall choice. Car A is better than car B because I looked at all of the attribute values, I compared them, I multiplied them by the weight of the, the, the attribute weights in arriving at, and the reason why that's called a normative rule is because that's what you ought to do if you're trying to maximize utility. You look at all of the possible information. But the reality is that people don't do that. When I'm choosing toothpaste, I don't sit there and engage in an incredibly computationally costly you know, process like the one I just described. Rather, I use what, to use your term, so a, a law of, uh, what do you call it? A low Least effort. effort. Or, Least effort. Yeah, law of least effort. Basically, yeah. the people will choose the easier path when one is available. Right. So, so there's a whole field within behavioral decision making that looks at, and, and the guys who really developed this, there's a great book called The Adaptive Decision Maker by Payne, Bettman, and Johnson. And actually, Johnson was also a former doctoral student of, of my, uh, of my doctoral supervisor was also his, his supervisor. Uh, so, so for those of you who are interested, it's called the adaptive decision maker. What they did basically is they mapped a whole bunch of decision rules that we use that are not nearly as effortful as many of, you know, what the normative rules should be. So here's one, for example, this, this one was, the, was, uh, originally, uh, uncovered by Amos Tversky. So the lexicographic rule, so this is really least effort would be. I don't look at all of the attribute values. I simply look at my most important attribute and I choose the alternative that scores the highest on that most important attribute. So for example, if I'm choosing between two cars, if price is the most important attribute for me, I will choose the car that costs less and I'm done. Now let's apply this to say Trump versus Clinton last election. And, and I use that model to explain how perfectly rational people could have chosen Trump. It might be the case that had, had people looked at all of the information, they would have chosen Hillary Clinton. Maybe yes, maybe no. But let's suppose I use the lexicographic rule in making the choice between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And let's suppose my most important attribute is authenticity or immigration policy. If I believe rightly or wrongly that Trump scores better on that attribute, that's it. I stop and choose Trump. So, so this is exactly speaking to your least effort thing, because I only looked at one attribute, my most important attribute in making a choice. I didn't look at 50 attributes. So, so yes, there's a whole field within behavioral decision-making that is very much founded on the principle that we use these mental shortcuts in making decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny that you had mentioned uh, immigration back in summer of 2016, uh, before the election. I did not call 2016 election for Trump. I've, I've had Scott Adams on the show who oh, right. uh, they analyzed uh, messaging and actually did predict that Trump would win. I did, I did not uh, predict that, but I did compare the messaging of uh, Trump and Hillary Clinton on immigration. Uh, and Hillary Clinton had a nine point plan uh, that held, you know, these complicated programs, this program we're going to change in this way, all these acronyms for programs that I'm sure nobody outside of uh, the Beltway would have any clues to what those acronyms meant. Uh, and it was very complex messaging where Trump said, I'll build a wall. And people ask, press them for specifics. It's, it's a big wall, a big wall, a beautiful wall. Right. Uh, you know, and to me, that was um, very much sort of system one messaging for Trump, system two messaging for Clinton. Uh, and trying to understand what Clinton was going to do would take a lot of effort where, uh, you know, Trump's idea, whether or not it was a good idea or bad idea, that didn't matter. It was a simple idea that your brain could process without any cognitive effort at all. Exactly. We could envision in our mind uh, a giant wall. Now, maybe you would envision that as be being a bad thing. Maybe you'd envision it as being a good thing, but you do not have to think about it to understand it. And right. I think that by uh, simplifying or perhaps oversimplifying in many cases issues, uh, you know, Trump was able to communicate in a very different way than Clinton was. Clinton being a policy wonk who you know, really deeply understood many of these issues, uh, but could not necessarily communicate that in a way that uh, would resonate with voters in, who did not have her level of understanding. 
And, and that speaks, by the way, to, uh, I wrote an article, uh, I, I can't remember now, maybe two, three years ago on my Psychology Today column. Uh, it, it was titled, uh, Marketing is Life and Life is Marketing. And one of the ideas that I have for a future book is to really expand this idea because I'm, what, I'm, what I basically am arguing there is that everything in life is marketing, right? So the example that you just gave is marketing. How do you sell an idea? I'm, me being on your show right now, I'm marketing, well, yes, of course, the, the book, but I'm marketing my idea. So oftentimes what you have is great scientists who are very, very good within their very narrow fields of specialization, but take them out of their lab and they're buffoons. They're idiots, right? They, I mean, they literally cannot excite people about what they're doing. And, and I understand that not everybody has the same eloquence. Not everybody has the same uh, you know, charismatic personality. Not everybody can appear on Joe Rogan and excite 20 million fans. But in a sense, that's, that's really a missed opportunity because in today's world of these incredible platforms that we have to market ideas, you know, I could spend my time writing a peer-reviewed article, which of course I love doing and will hopefully forevermore do because it's part of my job as a professor. But, you know, if a paper gets cited 100 times 10 years after it's published, my God, that was a successful paper, 100 times. If I go on Joe Rogan, well, within a week, it's been downloaded 20 million times. Now, I'm not comparing these two things, but I'm saying if I am someone who is in the business of creating knowledge and then Step two, disseminating knowledge. I should be using all these tools. So everything in life is marketing. We market ourselves in the mating market. We market ourselves in the labor market. We market ourselves among different possible prospective groups of friendship markets. So, so when people sort of don't understand marketing, they, they really think of marketing as the most basic thing. You know, how does a restaurateur create a menu? Uh, how do you send out flyers to get people to come to your nightclub? Sure, that's marketing, but marketing as a scientific discipline is really everything. Anthropology, economics, mathematical modeling, in my case, biology and psychology, it's all comes together in marketing. And so for anybody who's viewing out there, marketing is a very exciting thing to study. Well, I think uh, that would probably be a good place uh, to wrap up, Gad. Let me remind our listeners and viewers that we are speaking with Gad Sad, author of The Parasitic Mind, which I'm holding up here for those folks who can see it. Uh, a really fascinating book uh, about infectious ideas uh, and how to protect yourself against the wrong kind of infectious ideas. So again, how can our listeners and viewers find you if they want to connect with you? Yeah, thank you for asking. Uh, so I, I certainly you can follow me on uh, Twitter at Gad, G-A-D-S-A-A-D. I have a YouTube channel called The Sad Truth, S-A-A-D after my name. Uh, I also have a podcast if you don't want to stream it on YouTube, but you want to have it in your ears. Also, The Sad Truth with Dr. Sad. Uh, I have a public Facebook page. So it's not difficult to find me. Get out there and make sure to get a copy of your book to protect yourself and your children from these parasitic ideas. Well, that's great. We will link to all those places, to the book and any other resources we spoke about on the show notes page at rogerdooley.com slash podcast. And we'll have text, audio, and video versions of this conversation there as well. Yeah, thanks so much for being on the show. It's been a fun one. Thank you so much, Roger. Great talking to you. Cheers.